so if anyone isn't aware, you're responsible for all the construction around here, all the road closures and everything around here, because we're sitting in an opportunity zone, which was, of course, the brainchild of you and Steven Mnuchin and uh, the, whole, the whole group there. And uh, it's been really fantastic. Uh, you know, you're sitting inside an opportunity zone investment building right now that was used, used the tax benefits from the opportunity zone program. When you left office, you released a press, a press release that stated that so far, over 1 million Americans have been lifted out of poverty because of the Opportunity Zone program. But, you know, the Opportunity Zones are absolutely just that, Opportunity Zones. And basically, it was created as a result of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act and uh, provided the ability for people to uh, take unrealized capital gains and uh, save the taxes on them by investing in these areas. So uh, you get a 10% decrement in the capital gains tax you owe on the money you put in if you leave it in for five years, 15% if you leave it in for seven years. If you leave it in for 10 years, you don't have to pay any capital gains on the new money that was realized. And of course, uh, the left jumped all over it and said, this is just a boondoggle to allow rich people to get richer. But newsflash, rich people are going to get richer anyway. Okay? <laughs> so if, in fact, you can find a way to get them to take the money that they are going to be investing anyway and invest it in the areas that are traditionally economically neglected, that is a win-win situation. And of course, the uh, Council on of Economic Advisors uh, put out its report last August on Opportunity Zones. And uh, it was anticipated that they would attract about $100 billion of uh, private capital over a 10-year period. It attracted $75 billion in only two years before COVID struck. So, uh, and, uh, create 500,000 jobs and just a host of domino effects. Uh, you don't hear a whole lot of complaints after that because it, it was just empty complaints. But isn't, isn't that what government should be doing? Recognizing that there's a lot more money in the private sector than there is in the government or at least there used to be until they start printing money like crazy. Um, but that's the money that you want to invest and to grow. Uh, rather than saddling those who come after us with just unreasonable debt. And I don't think, I don't think we recognize how much debt we are loading onto the people who come behind us. It, it's, enough to make me think that maybe we should put some kind of limit on our leaders uh, who are elected in terms of their age. Maybe we should have more people who actually have skin in the game, you know, who are still going to be alive 20 or 30 years later, as opposed to all these people who are old and going to be dead and don't care what happens to anybody else. I hope that's not the, I hope they're not all like that, but some of them are. And uh, it was Thomas Jefferson who said it is immoral to borrow money from future generations. I mean, if he were to come back today, he would immediately die again because he would see, <laughs> I just, uh, he would have a stroke. I mean, it's just incredible what we're doing with no regard to what's going to happen to future generations. So you, you, you mentioned a second ago about uh, people being way too old to serve certain, certain offices, be nice to younger guys there. So what do you think happens? What, what is the nature of power in those sorts of circles? Is it something where it takes 50 years of networking, 50, 50 years of learning and trying and institutional knowledge to be able to attain that sort of position, or is it uh, something else? Uh, it's definitely something else. It takes wisdom. And uh, there's a significant lack of that uh, I discovered in Washington, D.C. I knew that already, but it really became quite apparent working there. 
Uh, and, you know, you don't actually have to have a PhD uh, to be wise, uh, to be able to figure out what makes sense. Case in point, Afghanistan. Why would you withdraw the military force before you got the people out who needed to get out, when you knew that there were hostile people all around? I mean, a third grader could figure that out. And it's just unbelievable. And yet, we have people with that kind of decision-making capacity uh, affecting the lives of everybody. So that's why it becomes so vitally important, and I can't emphasize it strongly enough, for people to become active participants in the political process and know who it is that you're voting for and know what their policies are and what their record is. And most people don't. You know, when they go into the voting booth, they look for the name that looks familiar. It could be Satan. They say, oh yeah, I know that one. You know, they just uh, have got to become much more responsible uh, because that's the way our system was designed. And I think we have a magnificent constitution. I think it was blessed by God, quite frankly. But you have to follow it. It doesn't do any good if you just chart out your own course and say nobody can do anything about it. It's sort of like um, a couple of weeks ago with the extension of the eviction moratorium. You know, the Supreme Court had already said the executive branch does not have the authority to do that. And yet they say, who's going to stop us? Yeah, we're going to do it. You know, the way our Constitution is written with the three branches of government, the balance of power, and the separation of powers, it works beautifully if you follow it. But if you cast it aside, you start moving toward a dominant division in this case, the executive division. And they start making the laws. And they start enforcing the laws. That is exactly what the founders were trying to get away from when they created the system that we have. That's right. We had a great conversation with Senator Mike Lee on the very topic, mm. who is a very, very uh, noted co uh, constitutional scholar, and he pointed out that the reason why that's happening is state legislatures are advocating their power to the federal government. Right. Congress can't get along, can't get good policy uh, and get, get, those, get bills um, enacted into law. And so the f executive branch, the deep state, the dark state, whatever you want to call it, right. they, they, they absorb all the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what's You know, the whole federalism model. Uh, revolved around the states having power. And that's why the Tenth Amendment, you know, very specifically says anything that is not specifically specified in the Constitution inures to the state. Uh, but that seems like we've reversed that now. That's right. That's right. You mentioned a second ago Afghanistan. We talked about the economic burdens uh, that were sort of lifted by the, by the Opportunity Zone program. But Afghanistan, I don't think that's going to be a short-term issue. We were talking upstairs that it, I've heard the numbers as, as, as high as 10 to 15,000 Americans still in Afghanistan trapped there. And if you compare that to what happened in Iran with the Iran, Iranian hostage crisis, mm -hmm. there were only 52 of those. So we have 200 or 300 times more hostages for the Taliban to have. Absolutely. That's going to take years and years to work through if it even gets worked through. Well, when you, when you really look at the damage, uh, you know, not only are we talking about the American, Americans who are still there, but we're talking about many of the Afghanis who helped us. But more importantly, we're talking about fracturing the relationship between us and our allies. You know, I've heard... Uh, you know, the leading people in most of our NATO allied states express grave concern about the leadership status of the United States. 
uh, and uh, it seems to be eroding very quickly. And I think the American people know that. And uh, I think most are very concerned about it. And yet, we don't have a particularly good mechanism to take care of it except to wait for another three years or so to try to change it. Um, you want to put odds on the 25th Amendment be, being used? Well, I, th I th think there's a good chance that it might be used. Although, you know, the vice president right now is the president's best weapon because nobody wants her. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that helps him quite a bit. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Did, didn't Barack Obama make the comment that the only thing better than being president is being the one that c controls the president behind the scenes. <laughs> Something that I agree, yes. Yeah, uh, that seems to be the case. And, you know, I feel, I, I actually feel sympathy for the president because it's, it's clear that he has some cognitive issues and yet is being pushed into this position. And it's got to be incredibly stressful for him. Uh, not being able to remember from day to day what's going on and, and what things mean. I, I just think it's cruel and unusual punishment to do that to anybody. Yes, yeah. He refuses to take the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Right. I mean, it's all, it, there, there's no assessment whatsoever going on there. Like, it's, it's just what it is. Uh, he, he won't take the, the, the Minnesota Mini. It has 30 questions on it, uh, all of which are Pretty easy, quite frank. I mean, can you imagine asking him to count uh, from 100 down minus 7 each time? Can, can you imagine what that would be like? I hate to think of it. Uh, and, and some of the other questions would be very, very difficult for him. And we have to think about the fact that there are forces in this world that are not as nearly as benevolent as the United States, as powerful nations. And a lot of people don't read their history. And they don't know what the world was like before the United States became the dominant power. With all these despotic leaders going around crushing people who were weaker than them and raiding and making people subservient and killing the populace. And uh, if you think the world is going to be reasonable without the United States being the dominant power, I think you got a surprise coming. Yeah, yeah Kissinger's book, uh, World Power, World Order, I think is what it was. I mean, he spoke at length about that. You've got to have the United States there as the dominant power there um, in order for the, the stability of the entire world. Right. And, and it's not even just the peace, it's the economic prosperity that has been uh, permitted in a lot of other places as well. Yeah. And uh, you look at a country like Cameroon, which was having so many problems and so many of the people were trying to leave the country. And it was our government uh, that said, you know, they have incredibly rich soil there and agricultural potential. And they made it possible through relaxing some regulations for our farmers, for the big farmers, to go over there and to begin uh, cultivating the land and uh, created an enormous amount of ec economic activity and wealth in that country. So probably the biggest economic weight right now is the COVID situation. We've got this concept that's been preached to us for 18 months of herd, humidity, herd immunity is coming. Uh, but it seems like the folks in DC s seem to think that the only herd immunity is gonna come from taking the vaccine, not natural immunity, not things like ivermectin and, th and things right. like that that are, that are secondary impact. Give us your, your thoughts on that whole situation. How, how do we get to yeah. herd immunity, immunity if we even get there? Well, first of all, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of baggage here. Um, do you remember in the beginning 
hydroxychloroquine. Yes. Yes. And oh, this is just this is just a hoax. This is evil. This is uh, witch doctor medicine. Um, and they said that for virtually everything uh, that came up. Now you have to understand why did they do that? Because in order to be able to push the vaccine through and get an emergency use authorization, EUA, there cannot be an alternative. Like step number four in the application, emergency, <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. So you have to say none of those things work. Now, of course, uh, now people are getting the information that they do work and they're quite effective and uh, particularly with early treatment. Um, but, you know, between natural immunity, the immunity that one acquires after having had the infection, and the immunizations, 85% of the population has immunity. So we essentially have herd immunity. Now, the Delta variant uh, is not particularly virulent, which means it's not an aggressive uh, disease, but it is highly contagious. And it's almost, almost like some of the natural flora that exists on our body. Um, if we were to do a swab of, of all of our nasal passages, every one of us, for instance, would have staphylococcus in there. We're not going to get sick from it unless something happens to our immune system or something happens. But it's there. And I have a feeling that coronavirus is going to be with us for a very long time, many, many, many years. Um, it'll become attenuated so it doesn't cause a lot of problems, but it'll still be there and it will be available for use as an excuse to dominate people's lives, if we're not careful. Um, now, it doesn't mean that vaccines aren't useful. They are. They're probably not as good as natural immunity, but they are good, and, and particularly for elderly people who are very vulnerable, who have uh, comorbidities, there's no question that they should be used. But one of the things that we've always done in medicine, in modern medicine, is called a benefit to risk analysis. You look at, you know, what is the benefit of the treatment versus the risk of that treatment? And we don't know what the long-term risk of the vaccine is. Vaccines made this way have not been used before. And we know that it does uh, generate the conditions for spike proteins being manufactured within the cells. And those spike proteins can merge with cell membranes and uh, present a different antigenic picture so that when the next time your body uh, encounters a coronavirus, it is possible, particularly down the line years later, that uh, you know, your long-term memory cells might see that as something that needs to be attacked. And that's why you've heard the concerns about possible autoimmune disease emerging in the future. So why would you do that to your children? Adults, particularly elderly adults with comorbidities, absolutely no problem. But why would you do that to children uh, who have very little chance of dying? Their chance of dying is 0 0.0097. That's getting pretty close to zero. And, uh, you know, they're not particularly good at carrying and transmitting the disease either. So very little risk there. And yet we don't know what the long-term benefits or risk of the treatment would be. So 
common sense would say, maybe we better hold off on immunizing children. That's right, that's right. So it, you alluded to something there. So it looks like to me, there was guilt by association between hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin because they were both antivirals, as I think the class that they're, that they're in with zinc and maybe some other things there. But because Trump was pro hydro, hydroxychloroquine, therefore it ivermectin- can't possibly be good, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, what we really should be thinking about is uh, things like ceratovir. Uh, why, is it, why is that? Because it actually impedes the ability of the virus to produce a protective membrane. Uh, th those are called envelope viruses. Uh, Ebola is an envelope virus. HIV is an envelope virus. And... Uh, you know, these kinds of compounds have been shown to be effective against those. And uh, they've been shown to be effective against uh, the coronavirus as well. If we really wanted to solve this, there would be much more interest in those kinds of compounds. Why, why do they work effectively? And if we were really, really smart, we would say we may actually have the cure for HIV too. Because if you can destroy the envelope on HIV, uh, it then becomes vulnerable to the body's immune system and gets wiped out just like that. Yeah. So we're, start, we're starting to see this movement towards using regular actions and politicizing them. If you take ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, you're automatically a Republican, you should be shunned. Uh, you stand for the pledge, that's a political action. If you don't, don't stand, it's political action. Um, you even have, if you ask the questions that you alluded to in your opening comments, that if, you, if you're a parent, you, you question the teacher, what they're teaching your kids about race, you shouldn't do that. Exactly. You shouldn't do that. You're extremist for doing that. Exactly. And, you know, you, you think about these poor children. I think it's child abuse, to be honest with you. At, at a time when they're trying to develop their image who the heck are we? Everybody always wants to know that. And uh, it's, it's very, very, very sad. Um, I do think that we would be smart uh, to make sure that our standard history textbooks uh, do include the contributions of African Americans. Because uh, there shouldn't be a need for African American History Month, for instance, Black History Month. We, we, we should have everybody included. So, you know, most people don't realize that, you know, you look at these light bulbs and things like that, that it was Louis Latimer, who was Thomas, Thomas Edison's right-hand man, a black man who came up with the filament that made the light bulb work for more than two or three days, who also, uh, Diagram the telephone for Alexander Graham Bell, same guy, also invented the electric lamp. I mean, he was a pretty amazing guy, but you shouldn't have to go to a black history book to read that. Uh, when it comes to uh, locomotive engine lubrication systems, which had a lot to do with the Industrial Revolution, uh, you shouldn't have to go to a black history book to see that it was Elijah McCoy who invented the automatic lubrication system for locomotive engines and had so many inventions, people were always saying, is that a McCoy? Is that the real McCoy? You know, <laughs> people don't know that, you know. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, you know, I could, I could talk about just about any ethnic group in America and the tremendous contributions that were made. And it's, it's our diversity and diversity of thought and opinion and creating environments for innovation and entrepreneurship, those are the things that skyrocketed us to the top. And, uh, you know, we make a big mistake when we allow people to divide us on the basis of particularly superficial characteristics that really don't mean anything. And I've said many times as a neurosurgeon, you know, when I open the head, 
I'm operating in their brain, I can't tell whether it's a black brain or a white brain or a yellow brain or a brown brain. It's the same brain. And isn't that brain the thing that makes you who you are? It's not your hair or your nose or your skin. It's your brain. And, uh, you know, animals judge everything on external appearance. And animals are very good at reacting because that part of their brain, the midbrain, uh, is very well developed and is very large. The cerebral part of their brain, where they do actual e evaluation, is very small. And when you look at the human brain, it's just the opposite. The reactive portion of our brain is relatively small, and our cerebral cortices are large, particularly the frontal lobes, where you do all your information processing. So why do some people act like animals? You know, why do they just look at your external characteristic and, and start making judgments and reacting? Uh, you know, God gave us a lot more capacity than that. Well, so since we have you here, let's, let's keep the conversation going about the brain. Uh, so if you ever Google Dr. Carson, you'll find he writes some very, very interesting articles. I think it was June 7th in the Washington Times, you wrote an article that had to do with transhumanism. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about the, the, the desire of atheists to propagate, I guess, essentially make the, make the mind eternal. Well, you want to walk us through what they're trying to do and some of their arguments there? Well, you know, it, it seems like like science fiction. It does. But, uh, you know, they claim that just because the body deteriorates, gets old, and eventually is worn out, it doesn't mean that the mind is like that. And that the mind just needs a better place of habitation. And that we can potentially create a mechanism whereby your thought processes can be preserved in perpetuity. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that can happen when you go to heaven. <laughs> I think it was I think it was C. S. Lewis that said that you're not a body that happens to have a, have a soul, your soul that just happens to have a body. But the soul, the soul is, is, what, is what the essence is of us. It is. And it's, again, something that distinguishes us from the animals. You know, as sophisticated as we are with our MRIs and our PET scans and all these modalities through which we can, can study and analyze, we still don't know where a thought comes from. We're unable to understand those kinds of concepts. We're unable to create those kinds of concepts. And, uh, you know, all you have to do is make a telephone call to almost any company now, and what do you get? A computer on the other end. But are they really able to solve a complex problem? When you start telling them, uh, okay, I'll get you an agent, you know, they think they can't do it. <laughs> so you came, to, you came to notoriety by uh, these craniopicus procedures where you've got this, I think they're called craniopicus mm -hmm. uh, twins, right. conjoined twins, where the, the brains are actually fused together, and you've got to go in there and figure out how to take those apart. And... It was, I think, 1987 when you, when you performed the very first successful one in, mm -hmm. in history. And I think that's when you, you, you really rose to, to prominence in the American landscape. Walk us through the complexity of a procedure like that, because mm -hmm. it's, it's just unfathomable that you could take the two most, the, well, the most complex organism ever created and have two of them and have them all intermingled, and then you can, you can work it out. Well, it was very complex. They, they would join at the back of the head something we call occipital craniopicus. And uh, such twins had never before been separated, uh, with both surviving, because they share the common drainage system for the brain. 
And the blood flows through that area back there at a very, very high rate. Uh, I mean, if you put a hole in it, uh, it wouldn't take very long for someone to exsanguinate. And that was what generally happened in these cases. The patient would exsanguinate, no matter how skillful or how good the surgeon was. And, um, you know, when the case was brought to me, it was interesting. I was already starting to develop a bit of a reputation. Some people called me a hot dog, but I wasn't really a hot dog. Um, I was somebody who prayed a lot. And, uh, you know, there were situations that were deemed hopeless uh, that I would ask God to give me the, the wisdom to work on. And uh, sometimes it turns out that those were not hopeless. Uh, maybe they just needed a different approach. But um, with that particular case, you know, I was thinking they exsanguinate, they bleed to death. So how can we keep them from bleeding to death? And I was talking to a good buddy of mine, the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Hopkins. He had done a lot of research on uh, you know, hypothermic arrest, cooling the body temperature until the heart stops, pump the blood out of the body. And then on an infant, you can operate for up to an hour before you have to warm the blood back up and pump it back in and start the heart back up. And I said, you know, when we got to the critical part where we had to divide those vessels, what if we were to go into hypothermic arrest? Which sounds completely nuts, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I explained this to everybody. Fortunately, I was at a place like Johns Hopkins which has the best of the best in everybody. And uh, so we start putting this team together and talking about this and refining the idea. And, uh, you know, it, it involved everybody. Uh, even the maintenance people in terms of making sure that we had backup generators in case there was a power, we, I mean, we looked at every contingency. Uh, the head neural nurse would have me come to her office and lie down on the couch and close my eyes and just, you know, tell her what instruments I needed. And then she compiled, you know, a booklet that had all of the instruments and things. And the nurses actually created special drapes, unique drapes that had accordion sleeves so that when we reached the point of physically separating them, we would be able to pull their beds apart and the drapes would fall in place and maintain the sterility. I mean, it was, it was something that had to be done by all of us. You know, I get the credit as, as the primary surgeon, but I couldn't have done it without everybody doing their part and doing it extremely well. And, uh, you know, that's something that is so important to understand about well-functioning organizations and procedures. You know, being able to take advantage of the gifts that everybody has, uh, not being stingy with the credit. And uh, just, you know, it's one of the reasons that we were able to get so much done at HUD. We had some really terrific people, uh, really smart people uh, who came up with really good ideals, were able to execute them well, were able to work together. You know, that, that is really the key. And it goes back to what I was talking about with uh, American Cornerstone, the whole concept of community and being able to work together effectively uh, as opposed to making everybody into enemies, which, you know, as Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And uh, it doesn't matter how strong our nation is, if we continue to allow the seeds of division to be sown successfully, our nation will be destroyed.
So what's the solution for that? The, the, one of the, the leading articles in this most recent uh, Chronicles, which is the paleoconservative magazine, uh, title, A Tale of Two Americas, talked about this very, very thing that it seems that we're, fall, we're, we're pull, being pulled in different directions farther and farther. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no similarities anymore, even to the degree of you know, the pledges and the, and the vaccines and things like that. What, it, what is the answer? Is it purely a religious answer? Is it purely that we need, to, we need to turn back to God? It's a sin issue? Or is there something more than that that's happening? Well, uh, you have to ask yourself, what made us great? And as we move away from what made us great, it is natural that we become non-great. You know, it was uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. He came here in 1831 because the Europeans were so fascinated with this fledgling new nation, barely 50 years old, that was already competing with them They've been around for hundreds of years on every level. How could that happen? So the Tocqueville was going to analyze it. And he came and he, he looked at our, our legislative systems and our judicial systems and our educational systems. And he looked at the whole thing from soup to nuts, wrote a big two-volume set called Democracy in America. But at the end of that two-volume set, he said he was most impressed by the fiery sermons that came out of the pulpits of America that provided a moral basis for the people of America and that inspired them so that they were able to defeat the most powerful empire on the face of the earth. And he concluded that America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. I think he was right on target. That's right. That's right. Your faith is clearly important to you. You built your life around it. You're, you're vegetarian because of your faith, I, I, I believe. And that's, that's a little thing. I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize that. And, uh, you, you know, you and Candy have been very, very generous for 25 years with the Carson Fund, which you won the Simon Prize, which is the, big, the biggest philanthropic, philanthropic prize, prize. Uh, being offered. And so you built your entire life around your faith. Why did you decide to do all of this because of a Jewish carpenter named Jesus Christ? <laughs> well, that Jewish uh, carpenter is our Savior, the creator of the universe, and was willing to give up everything and risk everything to save us. Uh, that's why. Um, you know, as far as vegetarianism is concerned, I will tell you that one of the first things medical students learn in, in medical school is that there are two groups of people who live 17, 10 years longer than everybody else, Seventh-day Adventists and Mormons. Wow. And it's lifestyle. It's just lifestyle uh, in terms of what you eat or don't eat, what you drink or don't drink, what kind of drugs you put in your body or don't put into your body, and uh, other things that can add significantly uh, to one's life. But even more important than that is living a fulfilled life, you know, a happy life. I, I know a lot of people and have a lot of friends who are extremely wealthy people but are not happy. I would much rather not be extremely wealthy and to be happy. And uh, that is something that that relationship provides for me, that God provides. Uh, and he's been a directing force in my life. There have been so many times when things were going awry, and I just went to God and I said, can you, can you give me some direction? Can you help fix this? And he did. And... Uh, 
you know, he even found me the right wife, you know. <laughs> because, you know, I had been resisting relationships and really kind of directing my attention to my studies. And uh, my senior year in college, as I was going through that, I said, Lord, I'm going to stop resisting relationships, so please make sure the next one is the right one. And it was. <laughs> you know, 46 years later. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, that's the reason that, that he's the central part of my life. I, I think most people know this story about the chemistry test. In, uh, in college, at the end of my first year, I was failing freshman chemistry. Well, you can't fail chemistry if you want to go to medical school. It uh, <laughs> doesn't work, you know. And, uh, you know, the night before the final exam, on which the professor had said, anybody who's failing the course, I will give you double credit on your final just to give you that last hope before you were killed, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and I'm thinking, maybe somehow I can read through this thick book tonight and I can memorize all this stuff. And of course, I fell asleep. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I dreamed I was, I was in the chemistry lecture hall and this nebulous figure was working out these chemistry problems. And I awaken early in the morning, and that dream was so vivid in my mind, I quickly looked up all the stuff that I dreamed about. And when I went to take the test the next day, it's the exact stuff that was on the test. And so I aced the test and got double credit. And, but I said, Lord, you're never going to have to do that for me again. I'm going to start being a much more serious student. <laughs> <laughs> And he didn't have to do it again. But, uh, you know, I've seen those things happen in my life. So, you know, there may be some people who have doubts. I'm not one of them. I've, I've seen so many times when God has intervened. And um, I just don't spend time worrying about where things are going because I know he's under control. And... And I feel the same way about what's going on in our country right now. If I wasn't a strong believer, I would be in despair about what's going on. But God has it under control, and he lets us help. And we should be happy. He's, he's going to let us help. He's not going to do it all. He requires us to get involved to recognize what we have. And uh, this nation is a blessing to the world. But we have to make sure that we understand why it's a blessing to the world. And this is my prediction. I predict that because of the way we are, we're very reactionary people. We are going to reverse this situation. People on the right are going to have control. And they're going to be very tempted to say, we can never allow this kind of situation to arise again. In which case, they start doing exactly the same stuff the left is doing. We don't want that to happen. We want to find the logical center where we have liberty and justice for all. You know, every time I talk to Dr. Carson, I'm always thinking about Solomon, the greatest man who ever lived, the, 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 the wisest man that ever lived. And the first thing he said was, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. That humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God, that's where you get wisdom. That's, that's the first step. Amen. And, and if any man lack wisdom... Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James 1, 5. But, you know, that reminds me. God has a sense of humor. 
Have you ever noticed that? Because, uh, you know, I had a horrible temper. And one of the things that helped me get rid of it was reading from the book of Proverbs. Every day there were all these verses about anger. And uh, like Proverbs 19:19, 19, 19, there's no point getting an angry man out of trouble because he's just going to get right back into it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that was me, uh, letting that temper get a hold of me. But uh, reading the book of Proverbs is something that I started doing when I was 14 years old. I start every day and end every day reading from the book of Proverbs. Uh, and it so happens that it was written by Solomon, and it so happens that my middle name is Solomon. But that's not the end of it. When Solomon became the king of Israel, do you remember what brought him great fame? There were two women who came to him claiming to be the mother of the same baby. And what did he advocate? Divide the babies. Well, that's when I became very well known, when I divided babies too. <laughs> Dr. Carson, we appreciate your time coming, coming here to Houston and appreciate everything that you're doing for America, uh, American Cornerstone Institute. We'll, we'll certainly keep an eye on that. And, and I, I would encourage anyone that's watching the video online, anyone that's here, that, that it is a very wise use of capital to make contributions to American Cornerstone American Institute. AmericanCornerstone.org. .org, that's right. right, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for our friend, Dr. Ben Carson.